So what is Viet's theorem in 190? It starts with a polynomial whose coefficients are in whatever field. So if P is a polynomial with coefficients in any field we like, where here K is a field. So usually we'll think of K as being the rational numbers for the sake of this. But so when you saw it in high school algebra, it was the rational numbers. Um, and let's suppose that we happen to know all of the roots of this polynomial. Let's call them alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and so on, up to alpha n. So we'll assume here that p is a polynomial of degree n. So if we can enumerate all of its roots, then here's the result. And it's going to look all cryptic. I'm going to cloak it in notation for now, and then we'll unpack what that notation is telling us. Um, the result is that um, any well, actually, before, before we get to the result, I should probably be more explicit about what P looks like. If P is a polynomial of degree n, that means it has a leading term of t to the n with some coefficient in front of it. And then perhaps it has an n minus first power term, n minus second power term, and so on and so on, all the way down to a first order term and a constant. So we'll just give names to the coefficients of this polynomial, because it turns out that what Viet's theorem is meant to do is it's meant to link together the values of these n roots with the values of these n plus 1 coefficients. This is the value of Viet's theorem. <clears throat> I should probably write that down before we even put the result. Okay. It links values of roots to values of coefficients. Not in the probably the best way that we'd like to, but it turns out to be a very useful way. So what's the result? Now here comes the strange, funny, cloaked in notation way of saying it. S sub i of alpha 1, alpha 2, dot, 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 up to alpha n is equal to negative um, 1 to the power n, sorry, power i, um, times a sub i divided by a sub n. OK, this looks kind of nasty. Uh, there's a couple things in here I have to explain what they are. And the biggest thing I have to explain is, what do I mean by s sub i, this thing on the left-hand side? To get at this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the statement of this theorem for a moment. Let's go back to something that we do remember, something that you were quite triumphant in discovering in chapter one. So in chapter one, we had this awesome theorem from which a lot of stuff ended up flowing at the end of the chapter. This was theorem 78, the sum and product theorem. So let's move to that briefly, because Viet's theorem, it turns out, is just a suitable generalization of the sum and product theorem result. How come I can't? There we go. So remind me how theorem 78, sum and product theorem, what did it say? OK. So if P is a quadratic polynomial, so degree 2, then what? x1 and x2, its roots. OK. And so we were assuming that this a here was the leading coefficient of p. Yeah. Right? So p was a t squared plus b t plus c. OK. And if we assume that we can factor it, and I think we're going to make that assumption in Viet's theorem, that we can factor uh, our polynomial completely in the algebraic closure of whatever field uh, forms the coefficients. 
And so what was the conclusion of theorem 78? The sum of the roots is equal to negative b over a. The sum of the roots is equal to negative b over a. So x1 plus x2 was equal to minus b over a. That's the sum part of the sum and product theorem. What's the product part? Or a. Exactly. So are you already seeing a parallel between the conclusion on the right-hand side of the sum and product theorem and the conclusion we had on the right-hand side of Vieta's theorem? So what's that minus 1 to the i doing in this example? It's making that negative. It's making this sum of the roots theorem part negative, while the product of the roots part not so there's some alternating sign thing going on in Vieta's theorem that's going to generalize from what we see that one of these has a minus here and the other one does not. Um, what else do you see as a parallel on the right-hand side? A sub i over a sub n. A sub i over a sub n. And actually, I just realized, I think I have a typo. Or a right o or whatever. Yeah, let me fix this. This is a n, uh, n minus i, not a i. Um, but yes, this fraction that's over here on the right-hand side uh, is similar because what is a sub n really with respect to this big polynomial? What do we call it? It's the leading coefficient. And back in the sum and product theorem, what was in that denominator? The leading coefficient of the quadratic, which was capital A. So there's a lot of parallels on the right-hand side of the sum and product theorem to what's on the right-hand side of Vietz theorem. Um, and so what we need to figure out then is how do we generalize that left-hand side? What's so special about the sum and the product? So on the note, should we put this a sub n minus k over a sub n? Um, well, yes. Um, yes and no. So in the statement that's in your text, um, notice what, what is the leading coefficient in the statement in the text if you look at 190? It's 1. Yeah, the leading coefficient one. in the text is equal to 1. Okay. Um, so if we happen to have a leading coefficient that's not equal to 1, what could we do if we wanted to find the roots of this? Just divide everything through by a sub n, and the conclusion would still hold. Um, so if you happen to have something that doesn't have a leading coefficient of 1, you can fix that. So the big question of the day is, how do we generalize what's on the left-hand side? What was so special about the sum of the roots and the product of the roots that let us determine the values of the sum and the product of the roots without solving for the roots themselves? That's the real power of the sum and product theorem, right? We may not know what the roots of this quadratic are, but we know what their sum is, and we know what their product is without having to solve for the roots. We just have to divide, you know, just do some arithmetic with the coefficients, a, b, and c. And Viet's theorem is our generalization of that once we can figure out what this left-hand side is supposed to represent. So because this is a generalization, it should hold when the degree is equal to 2. And when the degree is equal to 2, this s sub i, which we're going to call an elementary symmetric polynomial, which is a lot to write. So let me abbreviate it, elementary symmetric polynomial. And because it has that i at the bottom, this is the ith elementary symmetric polynomial. Um, in the case of our quadratic, we really have two elementary symmetric polynomials in play. One of them is called S1, and the other is called S2. And as you might expect, S1 is going to correspond to the sum of the roots in that example, alpha 1 plus alpha 2. And S2, in the example from before, will be the product, alpha 1 times alpha 2. And if we make that decision, then checking the right-hand side of Vieta's theorem, we end up with, on this purple row here, where i is equal to 1, Negative 1 to the i will be negative 1 to the 1. a to the 2 minus 1 will be a to the 1, divided by a2, the leading coefficient. On the second row, where i is equal to 2, we'll end up with negative 1 to the 2 times a to the 2 minus 0, uh, sorry, a to the 2 minus 2, so a0, over a2. And sure enough, because negative 1 to the first power is equal to negative 1. Actually, let me 
leave that there and continue the thought over here. This is negative a1 over a2 for a quadratic. And this would be positive a0 over a2 for a quadratic. And what are a1 and a2? They're exactly what we call on the other slide b and a, respectively. And a0 would be c, the constant term in the quadratic. So there's the connection, again, flipping forward to our sum and product theorem again, when we called the coefficients a, b, and c, and we called the roots x1 and x2. Here we're calling the coefficients a0 up through a n, and the roots alpha 1 up through alpha n. Um, but the result for a quadratic should still hold. So the sum and product theorem is nothing more than a corollary, a special case of the n's theorem. Um, but again, I keep teasing you with this. How do we generalize this left-hand side? If we're in a situation where we have more than two roots, because we have a polynomial with a degree more than two. So we need the definition of what in the world an elementary symmetric polynomial is in general. So for that, we get a brand new blank slate here. So this definition in your text, let me make sure I get the reference right. This is definition 185. So here's where we get a sense of what elementary symmetric polynomials are. And the notation for this looks horrific also. It's just one of these cases where what mathematicians write and what they mean uh, take up very different amounts of space in their heads, right? Um, what takes me this much space on the page to write um, can be explained very simply if I were just had like a page worth of, uh, of prose. So it's really just compacting a lot of information into a small space. Um, so let's take a look at this definition that's written in here for elementary symmetric polynomial. So the elementary symmetric polynomial, so there's a claim of uniqueness there, the elementary symmetric polynomial of degree n, of degree, sorry, um, degree, what does it say here? Oh, of degree n, OK is, and then there's this really strange looking summation notation um, that says absolute value of capital I is equal to N, and then underneath that it says zero is less than or equal to I sub J is less than or equal to N, no sorry, less than or equal to one, uh, and then we have T raised to the power of capital I, uh, and then there's some mumble in there about how capital I is a multi-index, so it's an ordered N tuple of exponents, essentially. I1, I2, dot, dot, I n. And so if I say t raised to the power i, what I really mean is t1 raised to the power i1 times t2 raised to the power i2 times dot, dot, up to tn raised to the power i n. So again, it's, it's even sort of compact notation within a compact rendition of a compact definition. Um, so if we consider this totally indecipherable, let's do that for now. Let's just agree to, to disagree on how we write this. Um, and let's get down to brass tacks. What does this actually look like? So first of all, let me back up a bit and ask you to help me take apart this definition. Say the word symmetric at the top here. Going back to our sum and product example, what is it that makes these two polynomials on the left-hand side symmetric? In what sense are they symmetric? You change the order? If you change the order of what? x1 plus x2. If I change the order of x1 and x2, if x1 and x2 trade places, what happens? We get the same thing. We get the same thing. There's the symmetry action that we're talking about. So. That's the definition of what makes a polynomial symmetric. <coughs> so symmetric means here that its value is unchanged under, and here I have to put an article. Um, let me put a quantifier, rather. Let me put, for now, the quantifier any. 
So to be symmetric, we want the value to be unchanged under a permutation of the variables, x1 and x2. If it happens to be symmetric under every permutation of those variables, you usually add another word for emphasis and call it fully symmetric. Um, so in this example, these two polynomials are, in fact, fully symmetric, because any way that I transpose x1 and x2, how many ways are there to transpose x1 and x2, by the way? Yeah. We have only two variables, and so the choices are to do nothing or, as Robert said, to trade places. So those two permutations, both of those, preserve uh, the value of these polynomials. Um, and because that covers all possibilities, we can call these two fully symmetric. Um, so let's take it up a notch. Now that we know what fully symmetric means, let's see if we can come up with what the elementary symmetric polynomials of degree 3 might look like. So for degree 3, we have three variables here. Let's call them alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. Oh, let's make them x1, x2, x3. Let's go easy on the eyes here, spare the Greek for a second. Um, how could I take those three variables and make a symmetric polynomial analogously to how we made symmetric polynomials over here? Give me one thing that I could do with x1, x2, and x3. I could add them all together. How do we know that that's fully symmetric? Because addition is commutative, right? Addition of, uh, of complex numbers, or wherever these live. Because they live in a field, addition is commutative in a field. So this is definitely going to be fully symmetric. Um, how many different permutations of these roots can I possibly have now? Six, how come? Yeah, after all, what is the group, what is the abstract group that tells us how many different ways there are to permute these three variables? S3. And now you see why we talk about symmetric groups so much this semester. It's because these permutations of roots turn out to be central to our story, right? That is our one sentence mantra for the course. Permutation groups acting on polynomial rings and their roots. This is the permutation groups acting on roots. And the sum x1 plus x2 plus x3 is fully symmetric. And what's the degree of this polynomial? It's funny because it's a multivariable polynomial, but what's its degree? Its degree is 1. Because none of the terms as a monomial has a degree any larger than 1. The degree of the first term is 1. The degree of the second term is 1. The degree of the third term is 1. And so we call this one the first elementary symmetric polynomial in three variables is the sum of all three. What happens if we try to ape the other example? How could we generalize x1 times x2 to a situation of three variables? Multiply all three of them together. Is that fully symmetric? Terry's a little unsure. Why does this give you pause? Well, I guess we've been a little bit loose in describing where these roots must live. These roots have to live somewhere. Um, and I think for the sake of our discussion today, we will assume that these roots live in a field. Um, even if we haven't constructed such a field yet, that field would be the algebraic closure of the coefficient field. Um, but if, if I assure you for the moment that these coefficients live in a field, is this fully symmetric? Yes, how come? What do we know about multiplication in a field? Associative. Associative and commutative. commutative. And it's commutative because every field is first and foremost a commutative ring. Right. So again, because of that commutativity, this is also a fully symmetric polynomial. Any way in which I rearrange these three x1, x2, and x3s is going to give me the same value for that product. Um, 
And so I'm going to call this also an elementary symmetric polynomial. But what's the degree of this elementary symmetric polynomial? It only has one term. And the degree of that term would be The sum of the exponents on any monomial is the degree of that monomial. So we call that the 